Before we go any further in our technological architect journey and we start learning about the different architectures you can use on cloud applications, we'll first talk about cloud native concepts. So um, I've zoomed out now, but I'll zoom in and we'll go over all the things one by one. Almost all of the applications that you'll build now, uh, at, at least 2022 and onwards, will be mostly on the cloud. Uh, these days, people don't really build new applications for on-prem servers. I mean, there's some industries that still do that, like the banking industry. Uh, but mostly, if you're watching this video, I think 99% of you will fall into the category of cloud. Uh, you know, you'll be building something for the cloud. So uh, the benefits that you get with a cloud native architecture. So you know, your application, if it's on the cloud completely, it's cloud native. And that's where it was designed for. That's where it'll stay forever. Uh, not forever, but, you know, for the, at least for the future. So um, <clears throat> the, the benefits that you get is you get disposable infrastructure with the cloud, right? So all infrastructure that you add to your cloud, it's very easy to dispose of. You can just turn off any server. You can remove any server from your uh, you know, infra, you can remove RAM, you can remove uh, cache, whatever you want to remove, you can remove that from your infra. It's very easy to scale down and removal is as simple as adding new components. This was not the case when we had actually had on-prem servers, you actually had to uh, bring in new processors and RAMs and you had to actually had to configure uh, new uh, machines to work as caches and differently as servers and to differently as forward proxies or reverse proxies or load balancers, you have to configure everything yourself. On the cloud, you don't have to, it's, everything is just a click away, okay? And all of that is abstracted away from us, everything is happening there at some data center, but we don't have to worry about it. So that's the ben the, that's the beauty that you get with cloud native concepts. So uh, cloud native infrastructure and apps is that you get disposable infrastructure. So whenever you hear this term, disposable infrastructure, this is what it means, this is what you should know, this is what you should register in your mind. Disposable infra basically means it's very easy to uh, scale up, scale down, add and remove resources from your infra. Uh, with cloud native applications, uh, you also get bounded components. Now, uh, these terms, not necessarily that these terms have to be checked off for anything to be called as a cloud native applications, but usually you'll see these things as being part of a cloud native application. So bounded components are uh, basically means that every single component, you know, you can, you can bound it in its own little functionality. So you can have separate components for separate functionality. So for example, orders could be a microservice, but it could have its own little uh, bounded context going on. It could be multiple microservices clubbed into one big macro uh, service called orders, right? So that's a bounded component where everything is kind of bounded by its own context. Everything has its own context and you know um, all of the things are grouped together. And then you can also isolate components. So it basically means that you can, uh, you know, you can have a lot of isolation to reduce blast radius. What does that mean? So when, when systems fail, when failures happen, when things go down, uh, you don't want the entire cloud application to go down. You don't. You want it to have into bounded context, like I talked about earlier. But you also want to have isolation between those components, so that if one system goes down, if one component goes down, you don't want this to affect the other components. Another big benefit that you get with working with cloud native applications is that you can decide based on each component uh, as to which service provider or cloud provider should that component reside with. So if you, th if you think that your distributed messaging is better with Amazon Kinesis and you don't want to set up your own uh, Kafka cluster on let's say DigitalOcean or um, GCP, you can go with AWS Kinesis. If you think your uh, cloud Google Cloud functions are cheaper than your AWS Lambda functions, then you can go for those specific components on your uh, Google Cloud and so on and so forth, right? So your database could be somewhere else, your uh, messaging could be somewhere else, or your entire components, like your orders components uh, could be on AWS and your orders and your uh, payments components could be on DigitalOcean uh, and so on. So many companies, they, they like keeping uh, all the components on one particular cloud provider, but then there are so many companies that take a decision based on component by component basis and every team is, uh, you know, has their own independence uh, to and, and their own freedom to actually decide on which uh, cloud provider they should use for which particular component. So you can you can use uh, Linode, DigitalOcean, Heroku, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure, depending on uh, you know which one is cheaper, which one is faster, which one is more relevant to your use cases, which has which one of these has the right um, you know. <laughs> 
uh, functionalities and also the, the most importantly which one for which one are you getting free credits for right aws gives you a lot of free credits so a lot, a lot of people end up uh, choosing uh, aws for many things all right another very important concept is the distinction between polyglot cloud and multi cloud so we were just talking about uh, multi cloud the example that i just gave you some time back uh, in this uh, in this step was about multi cloud where you could have actively have different services from different uh, cloud providers in your architecture so like i said you could have different components on different cloud providers but um, that's not polyglot cloud so many people get confused they think that this is the same as polyglot cloud and the reason i have put this in bold and i am focusing so much on this stage is because this um, is very confusing for many people and also this is a very important question from interview perspective now i know a lot of you are learning from uh, learning this from a real world cloud architecting pers perspective but i am sure that there is at least 10% of you uh, who are learning from an interview perspective who are uh, actually wanting to be a cloud or technological architect at some company so you probably uh, you probably want to know what kind of interview questions you get so this is the kind of interview question you you might get you you might be asked the distinction between multi cloud and polyglot cloud a lot of people get this wrong so uh, multi cloud like i said is when you have actually have multiple services on with multiple uh, cloud providers but polyglot cloud is when you have just portability in the sense uh, the way you've built up your uh, program or your uh, infrastructure is in a way that you can easily uh, you know move between cloud providers so uh, what does that mean now uh, aws has some services like uh, kinesis or dynamodb which you can't really uh, you know th there's no alternative to that or or you can't easily port that to other services so that's how these cloud providers they create something called as vendor lock in in the sense they give you these their services and you're not really able to then port to other uh, uh, cloud providers very easily whereas instead of using kinesis if you are using kafka if you are using instead of using dynamodb if you are using mongodb and so on and so forth if you are using general technologies that you could go up uh, go and set up anywhere else like digital ocean or azure or google cloud very easily if you could uh, you know port them very easily then that would have been polyglot cloud so a lot of companies they like being uh, their infrastructure or their entire uh, program to be uh polyglot cloud so that they can easily move between um cloud providers depending on who's giving them a better price or it's who's cheaper and so on okay uh and then uh, we just talked about vendor lock in that's when companies try to <laughs> you know uh give you services which which are which look really cheap and which look very easy to set up and which are obviously totally managed so that you don't you don't have to really worry about it but the the downside of being managed uh, of ha having a completely managed service is that it, it has a lot of vendor lock in very easy to my very difficult to migrate away from a high, completely managed service because if it is completely managed you didn't have uh you know you didn't know how your data was getting stored and where it was getting stored you didn't have a lot of control over it anyways and now it's going to be very difficult for you to move it to another cloud provider however there are companies that help you do this the companies that help you migrate but still it's it's a long and uh, expensive process okay so um cloud architectures cloud native applications have reactive properties that's what they're known for they're known for their responsiveness which uh, wherein they can have you know cache and cache el elimination when you when you add start adding caches in in your infrastructure it starts becoming very responsive because you don't have to make a lot of requests to the server in, if you're calling from the front end server or if you're at the back end server you don't have to make a lot of requests to the uh, database you can cache your data at these different stages it's going to be highly resilient okay it's going to be elastic elastic like i said you can add and delete resources very easily and you know scale up and down very easily and um, many in many cases your cloud applications are message driven or uh, you, with event streams like kinesis and all these right so they're message driven so um like i said you know you don't have to check all the boxes for it to become a cloud native application but the more of these you have uh the the more uh, cloud native it becomes right so if it's resilient if it is very elastic it's responsive message driven is just more cloud native of an application uh then you have something that almost everybody knows about virtualization right we all know about virtualization but i've still kind of mentioned it here that you can run virtual computers on abstract layers obviously 
that's how you can go and start up uh, or, or start a new server on AWS or DigitalOcean saying how much space do you want, how much RAM do you want, how much processing power do you want. That's virtualization. Um, and then you have resource pooling where uh, you can serve multiple customers with the same resources. Okay, You have the same resources, but then because of the help of virtualization, you're able to uh, you know, serve the same customers with the same uh, the, like multiple customers with the same resources. Or you could have a dedicated uh, resource. You could have a dedicated server, dedicated virtual private cloud. You could have a de dedicated database. You could have a dedicated team to manage all of your infrastructure. So that's dedicated. Um, so these were some cloud native concepts that I wanted to share with you before we moved any further. And um, I hope you're enjoying the series. There's a lot of deep information here, things that probably confused you, but now there's clarity, your brain fog has been lifted. And I'll keep continuing the series. Do, do subscribe if you haven't already. And thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.